Hello learners, in this lecture we'll be talking about the spiritual foundations of Gandhian development based upon unit number 9 of the course MGPE 14. I'm Dr. Shubhangi Vaidya from the School of Interdisciplinary and Transdisciplinary Studies, IGNO. What are the aims and objectives of this lecture? We will begin by attempting to understand the socio-political context within which Gandhian ideals on development emerged. We will also try and appreciate Gandhi's emphasis on the interconnections between ethics and economics. And we will also try and understand the holistic nature of human life, the material, the social and the spiritual that Gandhi emphasized. Let's try and understand the socio-political context within which Gandhi formulated his ideas on development. Gandhian development was primarily a response to the challenge that poverty-ridden India flung at a particular phase in the process of the development of Indian history. Gandhi took up the most pressing economic problems and issues into account and offered his own solutions. Thus there emerged a definite development theory based upon his ideas and experiences. Bear in mind though that Gandhi was not a professional economist or an academician. Gandhi was basically a practitioner. Gandhi was someone with a very, very deep connect with the most impoverished and marginalized Indian people. And therefore, his ideas on economics, his ideas on development emerged out of a deep praxis with the realities of everyday life in India, particularly in his engagement with the poor. The context of the colonial encounter and the exploitation of the resources of the colonized nation, that is India, resulted in immense poverty. And this was the key challenge. As you are very well aware, the colonial encounter was based upon exploitation of both natural as well as human resources by the powerful colonial power. And at the time of freedom, we find that the Indian nation was encountering huge issues of poverty, hunger, impoverishment, lack of employment, and so on and so forth. And throughout the freedom struggle, Gandhi's intimate involvement with the needs, with the genuine issues that were experienced by the masses was really the hallmark of his work and the hallmark of his understanding of development. So it's important to note that Gandhi's approach towards development had a very strong moral and spiritual component. He formulated his economic ideas and principles in the context of his design of an ideal social order, a non-violent, non-exploitative, humanistic and egalitarian society. And all facets of the social order that Gandhi conceptualized were based upon the philosophical premises of truth and non-violence that governed his entire life. And therefore, quite naturally, it was impossible for him to produce an idea that would be ethically neutral. When we talk in social sciences, we refer to ethical neutrality, we talk about value-free social science. However, when we look at Gandhian ideals, Gandhian ideas, Gandhian theorizing, we find that it is impossible to have ethical neutrality simply because his entire notion of the social order, like I've mentioned, was based upon certain moral, certain ethical ideas. Gandhi believed that ethics and economics were not mutually exclusive. And economics, which inculcates what we call mammon worship or worshipping of wealth, worshipping of riches, and which enables the strong or the powerful sections of society to amass wealth at the expense of the weak, is a false and dismal science. True economics, on the other hand, as per Gandhian thinking, stands for social justice and promotes the good of all equally, including the weakest and is indispensable for decent life. So see straight away Gandhi debunks the Western capitalist notion of development, of growth, which is premised upon profit, which is premised upon individual success at the cost 
of the weak at the cost of people who cannot compete on equal terms. So to quote some very interesting statements by Gandhi, he says, I must confess that I do not draw a sharp or any distinction between development and ethics. Economics that hurt the moral well-being of an individual or a nation are sinful. Thus the economics that permit one country to prey upon another are immoral. See here how important the colonial context becomes in Gandhi's understanding. Another quote, that economics is untrue, which ignores or disregards moral value. The extension of the law of nonviolence in economics means nothing less than the introduction of moral values as a factor to be considered in regulating international commerce. Once again, the emphasis on moral values in what is seen as commercial activity, which is seen as activity which really is devoid or beyond morals or really does not involve morals. But Gandhi insisted that good economics be imbued with ethical and moral values. Gandhi was very keenly aware, as I mentioned earlier, of the needs of the poverty-stricken masses for the basic necessities of life and he kept them at the forefront of his vision and action. As he said, it is good enough to talk of God while we are sitting here after a nice breakfast and looking forward to a nicer luncheon. But how am I to talk of God to the millions who have to go without two meals a day? To them, God can only appear as bread and butter. So even though he stressed a great deal upon spirituality and upon ethics, he was completely aware and conversant of the fact that on a hungry stomach, spirituality and ethics really mean nothing. He believed in the essential divinity of human beings and the God of the poor who was manifest in the poor or the term that is commonly used, Daridra Narayan, was a very, very important aspect that Gandhi placed at the center of his thinking. So while we need an ethical or a moral order, this ethical or moral order cannot be built on the hungry stomachs of the millions. Frank Moraes, the famous writer, wrote, to him, the basic fact of life is that man must eat. Freedom from want is the first article of his creed, and throughout his public life, he has worked passionately to free his countrymen from the degradation of this poverty. So, as we know, poverty can only lead to moral degradation. Every human being has the right to live and to fulfill their wants through a decent livelihood and through obtaining those necessities for living that will make their life livable and bearable. And the satisfaction of basic needs and the moral elevation of individuals are not antithetic, antithetical or contradictory to Gandhi. And that is why he could adopt a spiritual as well as a moral approach to the problem of development. So ethics and development are not contradictory terms. They are complementary. Indeed, both are necessary for the development of each other. Let's talk a little bit now about the study of economics, how it focuses upon the material life of individuals and basically also is a way of understanding how human beings live in society as social beings. The father of modern economics, Adam Smith, defined economics as an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. In fact, his famous treatise had a similar title. Now Smith, it may be recalled, did not really look too much at the human dimensions of economics. He focused more upon the wealth, the creation of wealth, the creation of value. Now this was nuanced by the economist Alfred Marshall, who spoke of economics as a study of man's action in the ordinary business of life. It inquires how he gets his income and how he uses it. Thus, it is on the one hand a study of wealth and on the other and more important side, a part of the study of man, according to Marshall. According to Robbins, Economics studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means 
which have alternative uses. So basically economics is the science or the study of trying to understand how human beings fulfill infinite wants with finite resources. What is Gandhi's perception of economic life? The center of his thought is the human being and not material prosperity or scarcity. Gandhi in fact aimed at the development, upliftment and enrichment of human life rather than merely a higher standard of living with which had scant respect for human and social values. Gandhi wanted to elevate his philosophy from a material base to a higher spiritual plane where human actions were motivated by social objectives rather than strictly individualistic or selfish considerations. So the notion of the economic man, which is famous in the discipline of economics, in which human beings are doing their utmost to maximize profit or benefit for themselves, a very individualistic nature of human life. This was in fact not adopted or this was repudiated by Gandhi, who in fact thought in terms of social and communitarian goals rather than strictly individualistic or selfish ones. At the same time, however, he acknowledged and fully understood the economic basis of human life. Let us share a quote by Gandhi. By economic progress, he says, we mean material advancement without limit. And by real progress, we mean moral progress, which is again the same thing as progress of the permanent element in us. The subject may therefore be stated thus, does not moral progress increase in the same proportion as material progress? I know that this is a wider proposition than the one before us, but I venture to think that we always mean the large one, even when we lay down the smaller." Unquote. The economic activity of human beings is concerned, as we know, with the production, exchange, distribution, and consumption of goods. And these activities, of course, are necessary not only for the existence or for human subsistence, but also for happiness and progress. Like we've said, human progress is not possible on an empty or a hungry stomach. And these economic activities concern not only the individual in isolation, but they also create social relations. In other words, all wealth, all economic goods are socially produced. We cannot in isolation have an economic system. It is always relational. It is always in connection with the community at large. And therefore Gandhi held that socially produced wealth must be equally divided among all those who play an important or an instrumental role in producing it. This is a very, very important thing to bear in mind. Since wealth is socially produced, it must therefore also be socially shared. He had a total integrated and evolving approach. And at the center of this approach was the human's entire being in search of knowledge and truth. And he rejected categories such as the pure economic man or the pure political man. Basically, to him, all facets of human life can be unified if one set of moral values is applied to all of them. And if the same moral values are not applied to all human activities, the result would be conflict within the individual and in the society. To exemplify this a little bit, we cannot have one set of values in our commercial and our economic activities and a different set of values in our social living because this will then lead to a kind of a disjunct between two equally important facets of our lives and thereby create social conflict and social tensions. There is a famous saying that man does not live by bread alone. Human beings don't. It's just not the economic aspect of life that is all of life. Humans have many impulses and needs apart from the economic one. So not just do we need to fill our stomachs, but we also have so many other wants, so many other needs, so many other impulses that take into account different aspects of our natures. Economic activity therefore cannot dispense or cannot get rid of moral imperatives and values. And this fact was very clearly recognized by Gandhi. 
The main purpose of the development, therefore, should be the happiness of human beings. Material advancement is only one ingredient in this. And if we look at contemporary thinking, when we find we talk about human development as a holistic factor, not just economic development anymore, this is something that Gandhi actually preempted. He spoke about this a very long time ago. And along with it, other elements such as the moral, spiritual, psychological aspects, etc., also need to be taken into consideration. And it is only then, when all the aspects of human life are taken on board, that persons can be truly happy, people can be truly happy, and have the ability or have the scope to develop their personalities in the fullest way possible. A very important creed or a very important tenet that we find in the Gandhian approach or the Gandhian understanding of development and economic life is the emphasis on wantlessness. Now this may sound like a very alien concept in the world that we live in, where accumulating luxuries, where accumulating material goods, where get getting more and more things is so very important. It is, in a way, it seems to drive our entire existence to accumulate more and more, to accumulate better and better material goods. So, as we've discussed, economic theory deals with the laws and principles which govern the functioning of an economy. And it takes into account three very important factors, namely that human wants are unlimited, means to satisfy them are limited, and therefore means have alternative uses. And the study of economics is basically we, when we try to understand what ways human beings use to fulfill unlimited economic wants through scarce resources. So had the wants been limited or our resources been unlimited or had both these conditions existed, economics as such would really have been redundant. There would have been no need to study it. Now look at how Gandhi turns this on its head. Instead of satisfying maximum wants with limited resources, Gandhi says, reduce your wants. He was of the opinion that wants are only the source of pain. You may experience this in your everyday life. When we want something very badly, we are in a situation of distress. We are agitated, we are restless. And only when we satisfy that want do we feel the pain easing. So basically wants and satisfaction of wants is not a happy process according to him. He thinks that the maximization of satisfaction is inconsistent with the maximization of wants. So when a want is a painful experience, we need to remove it in order to get rid of pain and in order to obtain pleasure or joy. And it is only the elimination of wants, unnecessary wants, that can result in a state of happiness or bliss. Related to this is the doctrine of non-possession. Gandhi very strongly advocated not receiving anything more than was strictly needed. Equating this with stealing something that does not belong to us. So when we want more than what we are really in need of or what is really absolutely essential, it is in a sense, according to him, as if we are stealing or we are robbing things over which we have no rights. And the tendency or the propensity to accumulate commodities cramps our soul and degenerates into the morbid desire to make a fetish of the external goods of life. I am what I have, we become what we are, or we want to become what we are. And this is profoundly depleting to our spiritual lives, to our sense of humanness, because we then become equated with the goods that we possess. And the luxury of the ascendant classes or the richer classes, therefore, according to him, makes them morally deprived. The monopolization of the things needed by all, by a few at the top, is unjust. And increasingly in the world, we see this huge gap between who we call the haves and the have-nots. Everybody has needs, everybody has wants, but the monopolization of goods by a select and small segment of society is really the basis of a profoundly unjust social order. And therefore, accumulation, according to him, is something to be condemned. 
because it is not something that can be practiced by all. Not everybody is in, a pos is in a position or in a situation where they can accumulate whatever they want or whatever they desire. And accumulation by a few amounts to the dispossession of the many. This is a very, very profound thought that the more we as individuals accumulate, it is at the cost of the want or it is at the cost of the dispossession of the large majority. Thus, what is the alternative? The alternative lies in giving up our wants or in renunciation. To him, renunciation is life, whereas accumulation spells death. At the same time, it is not that Gandhi was opposed to the rich. It was not that he was opposed to people earning well or, you know, those who are, uh, you know, the, the more successful, the richer, the more prosperous members of society. However, he exhorted or he, he, he prevailed upon the rich that you must earn, certainly, but use your wealth for the social good, not for personal consumption, conspicuous consumption or luxurious personal lifestyle. Wealth is something that has a social goal, a social objective, not just individual gratif gratification. Thus, as we can see, he addressed head on one of the most powerful drives in modern society, the drive for multiplication of wants, which is fueled by an insatiable propensity for superfluous or conspicuous consumption. And as we know, this is really at the basis of the exploitation of the earth and its resources and to further economic degradation and ecological degradation as well. Alienation is also a very important concept that Gandhi spoke of. He explained the phenomena of poverty, unemployment and economic distress of individuals through alienation and was of the opinion that the more we exploit or overpower nature, the more alienated human beings become from nature. And of course, he wanted to focus simultaneously on the relationship between humans and their natural environment, which would end human exploitation, which in turn is the very cause of exploitation of nature. So the interconnection between human exploitation of other human beings and human exploitation of nature is a very interesting concept that we see in Gandhi. And to him, the alienation of human beings is as much from the environment as it is from their true selves. Bread labor is another very, very important concept that was developed by Gandhi. It was both philosophy and economics. And in a precise way, it means that to live, human beings must work. And by work, he referred to physical work, to labor, to labor in which we use our hands. And inherent in this is a very, very important concept of the dignity of labor. It is not just labor of the mind or labor of the intellect, but it is manual labor, which according to him is really the very essence or what he calls the current coin, which enables an individual to achieve wealth or is able to earn his livelihood when he's able to convert his labor into the goods or the services that he needs. Bread labor, he also conceptualized as a yagya, and like I mentioned, the dignity of labor is paramount in his formulations. So to conclude, although Gandhi was not a professional economist or a theoretician, his ideas on development are of great interest and relevance in the contemporary scenario. His emphasis and deep engagement with the lived realities of the poorest, most marginalized sections of society was crucial in placing their needs and their welfare at the forefront. His understanding of the interconnections between the material, psychological, social and spiritual development dimensions of human life presented a holistic and integrated approach towards development. And to conclude, social justice and the creation of a non-exploitative moral order which is based upon dignity of labor and reduction of superfluous wants are the need of the hour. Thank you.